also in terms of creating wealth through um, digital payments with the work of Flutter Wave. Um, it really needs no introduction. In fact, in yet, um, yesterday, um, Dr. Andrew from PW said, well, Ian is so popular that his name is now reduced to one letter, he. Please join me in welcoming E to the stage all the way from Lagos, Nigeria, I believe. E, you have the floor. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Auntie. How are you doing? <laughs> Don't call me Auntie here. We are in public, man. <laughs> okay, sorry, sorry. I'll double at home. Don't oh, worry. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for inviting me, uh, Ms. Misery. Um, I'm, 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 uh, it's such a pleasure to be on the platform. I was listening to what Mr. Dylan was saying, and I was just blown away, um, particularly by some of the data. I'm really hoping that we will make some of the, um, I'm really hoping that we'll make some of the slides available because I, I myself wanna, wanna dig into those slides and those data points. Um, some of them I'm hearing about them for the first time. Yes, we will. Um, I think, fantastic. So um, I guess in terms of, I, I probably will just say a few things for like the first 10, 15 minutes and then we can kind of launch into questions and answers. Is that, is that what you had in mind, Ms. Yes, Toyin? of course, yes, yes, that's it. Okay. So, I mean, for me, um, I mean, you, you said a little bit about my background. For those who don't know me well, I'll just say a little bit more. Um, came back to the continent in 2013. But before that, I was in, I was in um, Waterloo, Ontario. It's a very interesting place because for everybody who has a Blackberry, that's literally where your Blackberry was made. This really small, tiny town called Waterloo, Ontario. I went there for school and I learned so much about building ecosystems from scratch from Waterloo because this was a town that had no business really like being a technology center but for some odd reason just by the determination of the cap of the leaders and human capital that was there this place was ranked one of the top 10 startup cities in the world but way back in 2010 because the leaders had an intentional plan for elevating their people and elevating their human capital and making their city a place that was amazing. And I watched that and it gave me a lot of hope. And so even though afterwards from Waterloo, I worked with a lot of startups, I built one myself that I sold. And then I, um, I decided, you know, I went to Silicon Valley for a bit, you know, it's always good to get that experience. And then I went home because I was like, if this small city of 400,000 people can build themselves into a top 10, technology center in the world like i live in a country of 200 and something million people surely like we can get like you know a hundred thousand people together and build something like that and so this this really kind of opened up um a lot a, a lot of my thinking and i went back to nigeria and the first thing i attempted to do is i attempted to work with government so a lot of what you were just talking about in terms of the engagement between government and private sector really and I, and I made the big mistake, which was, I made the big mistake of saying, hey guys, um, <laughs> you know, please give me regulation that works for me, you know? And they basically ignored me because they didn't, they didn't have a framework and I decided to do what I wanted to build. So I'll give you some context. And I, there's a reason I'm telling this story. So when, when I went to Nigeria, I wanted to help university students to be able to access courses that they didn't have professors for in their school. So for example, at the time, there were not a lot of Python or coding um, um, professionals in the universities. They were teaching a lot of old stuff like COBOL and all that kind of stuff. So I was like, look, why don't we help you guys in the university? Uh, we'll bring in the courses from the US and you know, just give me a license so I can work with the universities because I can't work with the universities without a license. And, you know, they just kind of ignored me as they could, as they should have. And then I was just like, okay, well, if I can't work with the universities, people still want this knowledge, what can I do? So I started a, a, a small practice that was helping um, people, mostly working people, because they were the ones who could pay, to be able to take on online master's degrees around the world. And that was how I met my co-founder, Jeremy. And we, we then decided, okay, let's go beyond people who can pay. Because, I mean, think about it. Um, working people in Nigeria specifically who can, who earn above 3 million, 3 million, um, I'm, I'm trying to do the conversion, who earn above $20,000 a year, right? It's, it's like very few, right? 
And these courses are not going to drop their price because they're online. They're expensive programs from University of Liverpool, from University of North Carolina. So we had to find that small sliver of customer who could afford the product. And then we decided yeah, that, that, was the, the, that was not going to work. Sorry. Okay. So, Komi, please, could you put it on mute? Thank Sorry. You. You're good. Thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. That happens. Um, so yes, yeah, so I so so basically we, um, so we started uh, to 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 we started thinking about how do we extend this learning to employment thing, um, to more people, and then we started Andela, and and Andela is, is a great example of an education to employment program. It's been adopted all over the world. Um, it's gotten so successful, it's had to kill its own learning program and just focus on the employment piece, um, while allowing other people to fill in those gaps. Um, and then after we did that, I then realized um, that, you know, it wasn't just enough that people have skills. And I think that's one, one thing we should talk about more, perhaps. People have skills, and that's great. But if there is no viable route to commercialization of those skills, they, they just become, you just become dangerously educated. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is a big problem that a lot of our young people in Africa have. It's not that they don't have skills or they don't want to do these things. It's just they don't have access, they don't have the kind of access. And I, I always have to remind myself that a big part of why I'm here today to the internet and can you get paid for building it, right? Mm -hmm. And that's why we realized, sorry, can you hear me? We lost you briefly. Could you repeat what you said the last 30 seconds? Because every word you're speaking is- Oh, like, I, I apologize, oh. okay. So repeat what you said the last 30 seconds, please. No problems. I'll do that gladly. Okay. So what I was saying was after we did Andela, Andela's successful model for education to employment, we realized that the problem was not just educating people, but also providing them access to opportunity. And by access to opportunity, I mean, you know, how do we, how do we build, um, how do we provide pathways to opportunity for the young people who who've educated because for a lot of young people, I find the problem is no longer just skills or education. A lot of them have it. The real problem is how do I commercialize, sorry, how do I commercialize this skill or opportunity? Sorry, just give me a moment. <laughs> how do I, I'm doing this at home, so please forgive me. Um, how do I, <laughs> how do I commercialize this skill or opportunity, right? As opposed to um, as as opposed to just educated and they have a lot of resentment. And I know for me, for example, that the reason why I'm where I am today is not just because I had the skills, but because I had access to the people who could help me turn that skill into a huge business. Okay, you in, you. In, in, in. Can you hear me? People like Can you, we're losing you. you. Hello, forgive me. Okay, <laughs> we're losing you. I think the bandwidth where you are. Um, yeah. And so, no, no. I realized I swapped, I swapped bandwidth to a lower color quality one. So I've moved it back. Forgive me. I think we should be better now. Okay. okay. Can no, you hear me clearly? Yeah. If you need to take two minutes to fix it, like we are all here to, to listen to you. We'll give you that. No, we're minutes. good. Okay. I just okay. swapped it. I just swapped it out. I just, there's a low quality, like uh, internet thing and, and it mistakenly connected to it. Okay. I, I like to use my US bandwidth. So we're good. Okay. We're good now. Okay. I, I'm sure you won't have that interruption again. Okay. If you do, just let me know. Okay. I will. For sure. I will. <laughs> okay. Okay. Great. So, so again, big, big opportunity here, by the way, fixing our bandwidth. And we can talk about that as well. Um, but like I was saying, um, like I was saying earlier, um, basically, we, we built this payment platform to help Africans to be able to build products and, and, and sell them all over the world, right? There's a basic level of access. The internet is a leveler, but many people didn't have access to making money on the internet. It was literally 
as of 2016, when we started Flutterwave, it was impossible for Africans to make money on the internet, even though they had the skills. And so we built the platform to basically enable that bridging to happen. Um, and, and the success is, is apparent. You know, I think we're the only company in the world that MasterCard and Visa have invested in at the same time. <laughs> um, <laughs> usually they're fighting each other, but they're like, hey, we got to collaborate for this one. Um, and, 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 and that has gone well. But so now, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about two things, and they came up a lot in our conversation with Dylan before I hand off to you these days. I, I run something called the Fund for Africa's Future. And the Fund for Africa's Future is essentially a platform that we're building that partners with innovators who are turning our continent's biggest challenges into global business opportunities, right? So, so what that looks like essentially is, you know, we're, we're, we're turning up our, 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 you know, opportunities. We're, we're taking our opportunities, um, our business opportunities, our, our, our biggest challenges, and we're saying, okay, it's not enough that we have these challenges and that we can't solve them. Let's think about how not just to solve them, but to use them to solve global problems because of the specific constraints within which Africans have to solve their problems. And those constraints are that, you know, most times you're starting from scratch, you don't have the capital, you don't have the access necessarily, and you've got to be three times as good because discrimination and, and prejudice is real. And, and so we, we're taking companies that are building IP, we like to do a lot of applied research in Africa and take it global. And one of the biggest success stories that we've had is a company called Tamboa Health out of Kenya. We invested in that company. They build a new kind of medical device that essentially does a way better job of um, um, respiratory health diagnostics than a lot of platforms out there. And they use something called sonic imaging combined with a lot of AI and ML and of course, the largest database of, um, of, of, res of like long imaging in the world. They have 100,000 samples. So they, they kind of use this small, tiny microphones they put on your body to basically detect whether you have pneumonia or COVID or all these other stuff, right? So companies filed 14 patents since we backed them. Um, Stanford, MIT, Harvard, Medical Sciences, um, research are using their software and their medical device. That's an example of what kind of trade we can do with Africa. Um, we're also working very closely with Mr. Easy on the Africa Music um, um, Fund. Um, um, basically work with him to structure it. And we're basically building this fintech enabled platform for artists from Africa who are putting out Afrobeats music to basically be able to earn globally on their distribution without having to sign up to a label and lose their masters. And that's what we're very, very excited about, right? We're very, very excited about all those things. Now, the, the, the final thing I wanted to say is the big mental shift for me over the last, let's say, two years, um, but it's come longer. I just came around to it, is, is two things that we mentioned earlier. Number one, engaging, engaging the government. I don't like them, but I engage them. I've been in Abuja the last two months. I work with everybody, I talk to everybody, I find out what angle works for each person, I play them off each other if I have to, whatever. But nothing's gonna change if, we don't, if we're just talking on Twitter and, and, uh, and chat rooms and we're not engaging the government and we're not taking opportunities to engage the government. Because we often assume that a lot of the bad they do um, comes from a place of malice, um, or like, like strategic malice. But a lot of it just comes from a place of ignorance, like you just don't know better. And so, what I try to do is I engage them, I work with them, I try to put things together. Um, some of the so early victories, you know, Kama got signed, right? Um, we, we have a bill coming out called the Bofia Bill, which is gonna transform venture capital because banks are now finally allowed to invest in venture capital funds. Um, and you can do offshore banking in free trade zones without the permission of the president. Um, there's another bill coming out called the Digital Transactions Bill, which is going to enable kind of a basic level digital ledger transactions. These are happening in Nigeria, right? This, this is happening in Nigeria. That's what people think. And, and the, we've taken it to the next level because we've realized, okay, look, you need kind of like a policy lab or environment so that you can move faster than the political establishment. And actually Nigeria's constitutional framework provides for that through something called special economic and free trade zones. And so, you know, there was a little bit of a rejigging of the leadership of the zones, um, a much more business 
friendly gentleman called Professor Adesoji, and we've been working with him and trying to figure out, okay, how do we leverage this, what they call it a sandbox, to basically implement policy that we want to demonstrate to government official has a practical impact on trade and jobs. And so we, we're building a, a platform called Talent City, where we're working with different special economic zones to basically reform their zones and turn them into bastions of trade and jobs. We're starting with services because we think services, the barrier is very low. You know, you don't need, you don't need to deal with customs <laughs> and all the awahala, <laughs> you know. You can just export, sit down here, write your code, go out. Um, and then we're talking about how do we raise capital for the infrastructure they need? Um, how do we raise capital? A lot of these zones are defunct because they've not had the right people um, I'm working with them. Um, so we're, 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 we're rejuvenating these zones and putting them in, in the right place, putting the right infrastructure, making sure they have the right marketing um, and that they have digital process because a lot of them are like, you're crazy carrying around paper all around and you want to deal with people in America. That's not going to work. They need to be able to sign up like they're signing up for a Delaware corporation. So that's the work that we're trying to do with them now. And I think as time goes on, uh, as things will go on, it'll get better. Um, but we need a lot of support um, and, and empowerment from everybody else. And, and for me, I, I like to look from home first. And so for me, that means diaspora first. I'm not going to go and talk to, um, we say in Nigeria, Oimbo. I'm not going to go and talk to Oimbo without talking to my aunties and my uncles and my brothers and my sisters. Um, so I want the, the world has changed, obviously, and we can have this conference, even though I'm in Lagos and you're, you're in Chicago. Um, and, and we have to leverage that as a diaspora collective because now I can set up a call and with, like now the chairman Senate committee on trade is going to take a call, um, a, a Zoom call. He knows how to get on Zoom, you know? So just giving them the ability to be informed is like a big deal. You understand what I'm trying to say? Um, and then investment, right? Like, we need to put our money where our mouth is before we can build the basic infrastructure for other people to be able to support us. And so, um, for example, you know, we've, we've been funding these innovators. Um, we try to go and talk to the LPs and development partners, and the English was very long. And we're like, look, we're not going to do this. We're not going to do this thing, um, you know, with the English and everything. Um, we're just going to go talk to people who understand the context of the problems that we're talking about. And we put up structures. We worked with world-class institutions. And you wouldn't believe it, but we've raised close to $700,000 for companies in just two months, right? The first deal we put up on the platform was done in 72 hours. The second deal, five hours. And, and, and we raised like another $300,000 um, in our rolling fund from everybody else. So, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Or am I going? Okay. So, so what am I trying to say here? I'm saying um, we're seeing we're seeing already that there's a lot of diaspora support, and it just needs to be more. Let's put our money together. Let's channel it in the right places. And it's not just about the money, also the networks and the access, right? But your money first, because we need to build basic infrastructure, internet that doesn't that doesn't come in and out. Um, <laughs> we need power. Right, we need all those things, and they're not difficult to build if we're and we can do a better job than government going to get Chinese loans and all that to build those things. So, we just need to be able to put those infrastructure together. And then, I'll say finally, um, it's about not limiting ourselves and thinking big, right? Um, there's no reason why African companies cannot go global, none, right? And I even think in the tech space, that's where I'm pushing our community and saying, guys. It's not enough that we dominate Africa. The money here is limited. Let's go global. We're building world-class software. Let's go global. Um, I'm pushing Flutterwave to get a European bank license and be a dominant player in the payment space in Europe, right? Um, and Deller is, is, is going global by default, right? Like we, we're doing a great job in connecting African talent to the rest of the world, um, uh, particularly America, but we can do better. We can go global with our ideas and with our platforms. And so I keep pushing people, let's not be African champions. Let's go global. Because we can also conquer the world. Um, it's not just the exclusive reserve of the Caucasians or the Asians. We too can do that. So that, that's basically all I have to say. And we can go to the questions and the answers. Fantastic. So, wow. I'm going to um, say thank you first. But I also want to do something because 
your, your energy, your energy is real. I also want to use this opportunity to kind of claim, claim my own, uh, my own rights as, as a uh, maybe grandmom in technology <laughs> innovation. So, because Absolutely. a lot of the things you've solved for back in 2006, I actually built one of the e-commerce businesses in Africa, but I did not, I did not put my face to it because I was tied up in corporate, right? You know how that goes, you're tied up in corporate America, you know, you want to, that's your face. Well, you're doing things behind the scene, you're, you're doing you know, stuff. And so back in 2006 was when I actually started building e-commerce website. And, to, and a lot of the cha challenges I faced, I'm super excited. All the solutions, especially the payment side, there was no payment solution for collecting payments from Africa yeah. back then. It was like, go to this bank. Here's this bank account. So the order would be, the order would be placed digitally on the website, but you, you had to then process it through banks. That was back in 2006, but I never put my face to it. And then, so when, wow. it, was, yeah, when it was time to do Nazaru, I pretty much had to resign because I felt like the work, the vision we have, um, the, the solutions, the things I wanted to bring, given my background, uh, working with the biggest brands in the world, I didn't want to make the same mistake of solving for Africa, but hiding behind <laughs> and, and not even talking about it. Like you would not, even, yeah. to, even till today, you cannot mix, you cannot see my name tied to the work I did back in 20, 2006. Um, so, th so that's something I wanted, you know, because I just wanted to put there, like, that's why I've been watching you um, quietly. That's why I've been watching your peers. And I'm saying, wow, how I wish, you know, this solution was, was available over 10 years ago. But hey, I'm super excited that 14 years after, people are really solving. So, but one thing I want to say is speed it up, right? Speed it We're up. We're working on it. <laughs> yeah, so, so that's, that's my call. That's why I gave that background. Is that back in, back in, like 14 years ago, the world was already transacting. We're 14 years late. Okay? Yeah. That is 14 years late. But I'm glad the progress we're making. Um, so that's one, is we're behind. We have to acknowledge that we're behind. Okay? The second thing I want to say is also acknowledge that we are actually also at the cutting edge when it comes to the continent. Because all the conversation we're having here is, is five years ahead of its time. The reason I say that is um, I also acknowledge that a lot of the solutions I solve for, even in my corporate, let me just say, put it out there, what I solved for in Walmart five years ago, it's actually now that it's been adopted. Okay? So, yeah. so what, what we used to do in strategy is we're actually looking at the future of the world. What's the world going to look like five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now? And how can you start building today just in time for the world to realize they, yeah. need, they need that service, right? So I also acknowledge that this conversation, Trade with Africa Business Summit is, is ahead of its time. And these are the early adopters. These are the risk takers. And I want to say, I want to encourage people to stick with this movement because five years from now, the snowball effect is really going to be felt by all the entire world. So what you just declared here, to say Africans can deal globally, absolutely, absolutely. But we are really, really, really at the beginning of what that looks like. So you and I, we all have an opportunity to help create that future that he you're describing. And that's why I want to encourage people yeah. to lean in. What you are solving for right now on ground, so critical to activate the future we believe in. I so much believe in it. So. So I think you, know, you and I have already talked with your team that we are going to bring you on on my live engagement. So, so basically, yeah. I want to. I, I would love for us as a group to dive deeper into that free trade zone because you know yesterday I was talking about services being a low hanging fruit for diaspora. Yeah. So I, I would love to see uh, what we can do to build on services. Yes, Continental Free Trade Agreement, they are so focused on goods and services. Fine, goods right now. But I think we, we can create a model that's, that solves for services. So I, again, I'm just piggybacking yeah. on what you're saying 
how critical and important it is, is I want my community to get behind what you're doing. I think we can, we can, we would love to understand it more. We would love to dive inside it. And I want to see how I can help. Um, I think I'm a big mouthpiece. I've become a big mouthpiece right now. I would love to see how I can also, not that you need my help here. You're, 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 ah, no, I need your, I need your help, Wanti, uh, please. <laughs> no, 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 <laughs> I need your help. He, uh, no, you've been to places that people like me, I'm like, for you, my name, ah, you know? So anyway, so yes, any way <laughs> I can help, any way I can help advance the work you're doing, any way any one of us can help. The other thing I want to call out being a connector is please do know that right now on this platform, we have the economic advisor to the president of Ghana. So as you're solving, for, as you're solving for Nigeria, I, I hope you know, doctor, that he's curious um, to sit with you, to see what you're doing in Nigeria, that maybe, maybe they might want to explore in Ghana. Oh, I, absolutely. Yeah, maybe. Absolutely. I, I would love to have that conversation. That so we should fun. definitely make that happen. Absolutely. And I would, I would, yeah. really, I mean, I would, I would say Ghana might be even easier for you to navigate. <laughs> no, I know it will be. I know it will be. So <laughs> no shade to my home country. I love, I love my country. But I mean, Ghana, Ghana is, a, is a very serious place. Um, and there's a lot more consensus around things like this. And it's so funny. I, I already started. In fact, you know, when, when you connect us, you will find out how prepared I am. Because Ghana is literally my next stop once I do Nigeria. My, my rule always with all the businesses I build Build it in Nigeria so that it's battle tested. Mm -hmm. Then the first thing you do is expand to Ghana. Then you can come back to Nigeria and do Shako. You do Shakara. Because they were like, look, Ghana is doing well and they're not giving me Wahala. <laughs> so <laughs> I love that strategy. Even in my Yo, mind. That, that's the expansion strategy for Africa. Every time I do it and it works perfectly, I'm like, look, Ghana didn't give me trouble. Yes. So if you like, I can go anytime. In fact, I'm having a conversation now that's exactly like this, you know, where we have a business that, that leases cars to female drivers and they're giving me so much trouble in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. And I already told them, I was like, look, man, I have more rights in Ghana than in Nigeria. So if you guys want me to pack my load, I'll be going. I'll join some rights. <laughs> so, <just, laughs> so, <laughs> so now everybody's like, oh, no, 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 no. You don't have to go. Let's sit down. Let's talk about this. So, but it's, it's a fantastic country. Fantastic country. So I'd love to have that conversation. Yes, and, and your strategy is the same thing I, I, I tell people. It's spot on. If you can make anything work in Nigeria, you, you are going to fast track your adop adoption across the continent. Like Nigeria, the complexity in Nigeria from the north to the south to Lagos. Like if you can make things work in Lagos, oh, you're ready to put it. <laughs> you know? so, so that's, that's a, but not, not everybody wants to start hardcore with the toughest market to penetrate, you know, because the Nigeria market is highly sophisticated. People don't realize it is. That. It is. It is, it is very. I mean, the the consumer market is sophisticated. They can sit at their computer. They they think globally. Nigeria is also globally minded. They're like we yeah. are the giant of Africa. So you've got to yeah. meet us well. So absolutely, I'm with you on that strategy. It's a winning strategy, but. It's not for the faint of heart. <laughs> no, it's not. It's not. I agree with you completely. I would not advise it. <laughs> but it's worked for me. I, it's a big part of how I've been able to build in Africa. Just understanding Nigeria is very much the battle-tested incubator. Mm -hmm. All the problems of scale you're going to experience, you will find first in Nigeria. And then once you solve those problems, expanding is easy. Mm -hmm. Very easy. I love it. So yes, um, I don't want to monopolize the time with you. So if you do have yeah. questions, please drop it in the Q&A. Um, okay, I see a question right now from Sam Lambado. I, I'm, I apologize the way I pronounce your last name. But anyway, he said, he, how, we, how will industry parks and science and technology parks facilitate ICT investment into Africa and help the youth access emerging technologies? That, that's a great question. Um, th there's a lot going on, but my preferred approach, like in our fund, we, we, we have a whole stream on applied research. So what I don't see working well because of where we are in our country is, uh, and on the continent, is 
you know, abstract research, like just like, oh, we, we, we want to research fusion or, you know, the kind of things that your university in the U.S. can afford to spend $2 billion on and not see any results. Um, we don't have that, that luxury. There's no money for, for that kind of research. So if you want to do that kind of research, my advice is usually, I think it's important, but just leave the continent and go and, and actually do what you want to do. But what's exciting about the continent is applied research. So research has applied to the problems that are on the continent. So your, your, for example, healthcare, right? Medical diagnostics is a big problem on the continent. People are misdiagnosed. The primary reason why people die is because they are misdiagnosed, mm. right? Not because of lack of doctors or anything, but even because they're just misdiagnosed. And so they use the wrong drugs until it's too late and then they die. So how do you solve a problem like that? How do you solve a problem like that? Um, then, then, you know, so what I advise, what I think is going to emerge is a collaboration. And African universities are fighting now for their autonomy. This um, COVID-19 um, and face-off between the government and ASU will really determine a lot of things in Nigeria. Because the universities are fighting for their autonomy. They're saying, look, we're tired. We just want our autonomy. We want to be able to control our destiny. If we want to go online, let's go online. If we want to go offline, let's go offline. Whatever we want to do, let us do. Let us raise our own capital. Obviously, there are elements um, that are not in agreement. But I think that that battle, combined with the willingness of diaspora to then establish centers of research within the universities. I'm talking to about four or five universities where I'm like, starting with education, let's help you build create revenue by establishing centers in your university. We can ignore the labor lobby, as I like to call them, and just create centers. You have decent professionals that are going to be working with you. They'll select the best of your students, make them fellows, and then you can rebuild from those centers. And government will ultimately doesn't have the money to continue to fund labor lobby anymore. So those will die a natural death. And we're talking to a lot of great, I don't want to put the proprietors on the spot because you know, it's a very politically sensitive conversation. But these conversations are happening. And I think what's going to end up happening is that the universities will become the research industrial and science parks where a lot of this research is done. And then they will now be scaled abroad. But for us to be able to enjoy the full benefits, I'm already seeing that we need to take IP more seriously in Africa. Unfortunately, for a lot of the research I have backed, I've had to help them translate their IP to the US, where I'm sure it is actually has um, uh, um, capital value. You know what I mean? <laughs> because in Nigeria, it's fairly useless. So we have to improve that. And I hope that AFCTA will help us as well to build frameworks around that. But a lot is already happening. Um, and I think the next vista in the science, in, in the IT space, is no longer just apps or websites. I think we went from apps and websites a little too early. And that's why you didn't see a lot of initial success. Um, but when we started to tackle the fundamental problems like talent, like infrastructure for commerce, and I think the next thing is going to be applied research. I think you're going to start seeing a lot of better um, stuff. I mean, one example, uh, a practical example, we, we, we had, uh, we were investing in a company next week called Relief, right? It's actually two MIT guys, researchers in the, in the, uh, in the agriculture space. They came to Nigeria. They live in Ikotik, Bene. If you know where that is, it's not Lagos or Abuja or whatever. And they built a palm nut cracker. So normally when people have this oil palm, which is a big um, product in Nigeria, women use their, uh, they, they crack it with their hands and it takes days, you know, to crack. But what these guys have done is they built a palm nut cracker that actually even foils itself by using the, the, palm, the palm nut shells. And they are already on a million dollar run rate. Um, they, they buy the nuts, um, crack the, the kernels, and then sell the residue to all palm factories like Okomo Oil and so on and so forth. That's a global business. That device can be sold all over the world, right? For, for, for majority, uh, um, um, because it's a $30,000 device that can create this type of productivity gain, right? So I think that's where you're going to see a lot of this coming from, the diaspora working with local researchers and building new applied research together. Fantastic. So one thing that I want to share listening to you, because you're, you're just speaking my language, just my background. My husband is a professor. So when you talk about academia, and actually my late father was part of establishing two Nigerian universities. 
So when you talk about the way the university is set up, I actually grew up in that system and I might be able to, you know, tell you one university you might want to check out to have. Uh, lovely. So, so, so let's see, let me explain. So uh, late 80, 80s, early 90s, the government mm -hmm. actually funded about two agriculture specific universities, universities mm -hmm. of agriculture. Mm -hmm. So there are actually, I think there are three now, but there are maybe only three Nigerian agriculture focused universities. And those universities are funded separately than any other university in Nigeria. So you want to check out University of Agriculture at Belkuta? Yeah, um, UNAB. UNAB, are you partnered with them? Um, we, we, we haven't yet started working with UNAB. So we, the partnerships we currently have are in the education space. We're still working with independent researchers on, on agriculture. Okay. So like, like you know, we, we have this team from MIT partnered up with some independent researchers from IITA. Um, and that's what we're currently using now. But I definitely want to get more universities yeah. into the network. Yeah, so, so one thing about that specific, because I went there and, you know, I will take it offline. If I can help you penetrate, yeah. they are actually already, their framework already supports what you're trying to do because they are heavily focused on research and they have international um, relationships because by nature they were built in Nigeria as a research university. God, that's amazing. So that's yeah. what I'm trying to say. And also, and maybe this is too much information, actually in the 90s, that's when I actually used to have um, packaged Gary made in the university. So they are actually more, mm. right. So, so when I was in high school, the university used to supply me Gary that is branded the university, with the university logo, sealed up. That's amazing. And that was in the 90s, right? So what I'm trying to tell you is you have two, three universities of all the universities that they are more open because by nature, by design, in their DNA, they are a research-focused university. Yeah. They are heavily yeah. funded, and they are more funded than any other university in the nation because they Fantastic. are categorized on that um, Nigeria being the food basket. So they have more money. Yeah. Pretty much they yeah. have. Okay, so we, yeah. I'd like to take that offline, and if I can make some introductions for you, I would love to because they will be more open. They are much more open. That's fantastic. Them. Yeah, great okay. stuff. Oh my goodness. Now I want to ask you more entrepreneurial, personal, if you're able to share. No, no problem. Of course. One of the things I say is that as Africans, Africans are probably one of the most individually successful people around the world. But as mm -hmm. a collective group, but as a collective group, we do not carry economic weight. Mm -hmm. Okay. One of the things that I see is this idea of I want to own 100% of zero versus 10% <laughs> of X. So I want to yeah. ask you personally, how did you set your ego aside in order for you to become co-founder of Andela, co-founder of Flutterwave? That's one. The second thing is, do you think that you would have accomplished what you've accomplished if you did not partner with people? Um, I'll start with the last question. The, the, the flat out answer is no. It would never have been possible. If I didn't partner, it would have been impossible for me to do that. I'll tell you the story. When I was of the company, and I was, yeah, I was, you know, the usual entrepreneur, blah, 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 but I suffered. I suffered. I was living in Barriga. I was trekking every day to CC Hub. Uh, that was where I met your brother. <laughs> you me. So, tell you all I my mean, story out here in public, man. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, okay. So, so, so we, you know, like, I mean, the, the truth of the matter is like, you know, it wasn't easy. And for me, I just thought, you know, and I think you really have to get to that point where the most important thing for you is being successful. Mm. It's not being, you know, um, um, the, the hero or being applauded. It's just like, I want to be able to make an impact in this world. What does it take for me to get there? I will do it. So when I met Jeremy and we started talking, I realized how much value he had to bring to the table. He had taken the company public in the US of all places, right? And we're talking and he was very interested in doing stuff on the continent. So I said, look, I was one who offered him and said, you should be the CEO. <laughs> in fact, let me know how I can make it happen. Um, and, and, and literally that changed, that changed it. And that has been my mindset, right? When I find other talented people that can add real value to what I'm doing, I just did it 
very recently for the fund. I brought on a very high profile person to the fund, not because the fund was doing badly. I mean, on our own, we had raised all this money. So it's not like as if I was, I, I, I was doing badly. I could have stayed small, but the vision I have for the fund is making it a global investment bank that can rival Goldman Sachs, but focused on Africa. If I want to do that, I cannot do it at my level, sitting in my small Yaba apartment and uh, uh, backing others and being the DG. I have to bring in people that have the experience. And so I took out of my equity and I gave somebody to bring them on board so they could come and lead the team in that direction, right? Obviously, we have to have values alignment and there has to be trust. But, and there are also legal instruments that prevent, if, if you have a divergence in views, you walk your way, I walk my way. There's always that. But it's so important for people to be so mission focused that it's more, it's, it's, it's more important for them to be able to get to where they want to go than it is for them to be applauded or accoladed or given a big title. So I think that's really how we get there. And I think Nigerians, Nigerians are very great people, but I think our biggest problem as a society is we're not mission focused enough. We, we, um, we Africans actually, we're not mission focused enough. We don't have grand ambitions for ourselves, unfortunately. And this is something that we need to change culturally. You talk to a Caucasian, look, in their, in their drunkest moments, they will tell you, we want to conquer the world. I'm not interested in all this small, small. You talk to a Chinese man, he will tell you, look, live story, China must rule everywhere. <laughs> you know what I mean? But you talk to an African and we're, we're okay being, being like local champions, sadly. And that's the biggest problem. Without a clarity of purpose as a collective, we're not going to be able to make the right sacrifices for us to get where we need to go. And that's why it's enough for people that they're well regarded as individuals and they stand out as individuals. But you don't have any collective power. Um, and so, as a, and because you don't have any collective vision for your race. And if you don't, then, you know, how do you contribute to the world? Right? That's, 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 that's massive. Wow. So finally, um, a couple of years ago, Mike Zuckerberg visited um, the continent for the first time. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. <laughs> and I believe he dropped $24 million um, in your, right? It was your work that yeah. pretty much attracted Mark Zuckerberg. To well, well, I'll tell you this much though. It wasn't just my work. He, okay. he came in, but, but a big part of why he came to be, to be honest with you, was, 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 um, was Andela, where he invested $24 million through CZI, his private fund. Right, but did anybody receive, I, I, I know that, but I'm saying, did any other person receive $24 million? <laughs> no, 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 nobody else. Not yet, not yet. We're, not we're yet. still pitching him. Okay, okay. So, 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 so the, qu the question was, how was that experience? How, how um, was that experience one? And then how have you still stayed level-headed even after that top of the mountain experience? Yeah, I mean, um, um, it was a great experience. I, it was actually funny. I was already, I'd moved on to my next company, funnily enough, right? Um, I, I obviously, to be honest, he came in maybe like two months after the money had already been raised, if, if you get my point, you know, like he, um, but um, I had already moved on because after that round, I was like, look, it looks like it's a great company. Let's go. Uh, so his people reached out and were like, hey, you know, I know you're in San Francisco, but Zuck is going to be in Nigeria. So I had to get on a plane to go to Nigeria literally overnight mm. to make it <laughs> in time for, for, I was so drowsy. And we, we, we had a short conversation and, and there's a famous picture uh, that we took together. Um, it was great. I mean, Mark Zuckerberg remains my role model. If there's anybody I have as a role model, I'm like, it's, it's Zuck. He remains my role model. I got into tech because I watched the social network, mm -hmm. right? So, I, I mean, I am, I, am, I, am a, I am a Mark Zuckerberg fan. You know the way some people are Jeff Bezos fans? I am a Mark Zuckerberg fan because I don't think anybody combines social purpose and business the way he does. Um, so it was a great experience. Um, it was good to be able to understand how he's thinking about the continent. I think, you know, Mark is one of the few people that's actually very serious about the continent. Um, um, from all the, I've, I've spoken to top level leaders in all the, we call them the, the, uh, the, the, the 
four horsemen yeah. of, of techno technology disruption. Yeah. Faga, eh? he he's, he's, the most, he's the most serious of all of them. I think the others are kind of tipping their toe or some of them are just maintaining legacy structure. But him is very serious. And then maybe the other person is, is, um, is Satya after him. So always very impressed by his leadership. I'm very happy that that visit unlocked a lot of other future engagement um, in, on the continent, which is exciting to watch. Um, the, the, the second question you had asked is, how do you stay level-headed? Look, I love the achievement. It was a fantastic achievement for a day. But when you're on a journey to the mountaintop, right, and you still look up and you can still see ways to go, it doesn't excite you. You understand that you took a, a, a picture with, uh, you know, it, it, it's a nice feeling uh, to get on the first stage and then take the picture. But I, I've forgotten. <laughs> There's so much more to do. There's so many more ways to go. So I think for me, it's that acknowledgement that we're on a journey and that we are so, so far away from where we need to be that anybody that is bragging now just has lost the plot, mm. you know? So I think for me, that's it. And, and you have to collaborate with all sorts of people to be able to get to that mountaintop. Wow. On that note, I'm looking at the time. I have to stop there. But um, myself and E, we have plans for, is it sometime in mid-August to get Scott on yes. my live show? I didn't care how it's on the calendar. So don't worry, we're, we're, we're together. Thank you so much, brother. I really thank you for the honor for saying yes. And, um, you know, we support you, we celebrate you, and um, congratulations on your various accomplishments. You make me thank proud. You. Thank you. Yeah, oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. So, yeah. thank you.